Uh, I'm Pam Thomas. I'm currently a city councillor in Liverpool, um, and I have a cabinet position of inclusive and accessible city. Um, so I'm looking particularly at making sure that disabled people are included in all policies and practice. I was very first involved in activism in the 1970s um, when the government issued invalid tricycles for disabled people, um, and they were they're very small vehicles. We only the driver in there, so you're quite isolated. And the government's own statistics show that these tricycles were dangerous, people were killed and injured in these vehicles. So I was part of a campaign called the Invalid Tricycle Action Group, um, and I worked with other disabled people to get these vehicles replaced with cash um, so that we could make our own arrangements to get around. And we won that because we got the mobility allowance in the, um, in the 1970s. And then I had a bit of a gap because I've got two sons and they were quite young. And in the early 90s, um, I discovered um, through reading a book by Professor Mike Oliver, and he described the social model of disability, which for me and many other disabled people is a complete turning point because it places the problem with systems and practices in society rather than us individuals with whatever condition we may have. Um, and in the book, um, it, Mike had mentioned an organisation called Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People. I'd never heard of them. And in those days, of course, there was no internet. So I got in touch with directory inquiries and got the phone number um, and rang up and spoke to the most amazing woman called Natalie Markham. Um, and that set me on a path uh, that completely changed my life and it's been a great adventure um, as I've met lots of other disabled people um, and GMCDP um, as it's known um, has been absolutely central to all of that. Um, it was, it's known as, and particularly in the 1990s, as uh, being right at the forefront of activism and, and work for equal rights for disabled people. Um, so from GMCDP I also got involved with a national organisation which was called the British Organisations, sorry, the British Council of Organisations of Disabled People, but they also slightly titled BCODP, which didn't really go for short names, I'm afraid, in those days. So that was organisations which were totally controlled by disabled people, disabled people's organisations, and it's very important to understand that because that's very different to organisations which are for disabled people, but run by non-disabled people. Um, and it, there's been a lot of conflict, particularly in the 1990s, as disabled people uh, became politically aware um, and campaigning for changes in society, which currently and still does exclude us to quite a large extent. So that national organisation uh, was also very, very important at that time. Um, also important has been disability arts. Um, and I'm currently a board member of Dada Fest in Liverpool and that organisation goes back quite a long time and there's a, a whole network of arts organisations, disability arts organisations but along with disabled people's organisations the funding has been lost um, in the last 10 years um, so it's very very difficult now for disabled people to meet and um, consider these issues of the ways that, the way in which we are excluded from society um, it's good that those of us that were around in the 1990s, we still do keep in touch. Of course, social media has helped with that. We, we all um, keep in touch on Facebook in particular, um, and we're all around the country. But we're not getting younger people coming through who understand that we are disabled by systems and practice in society, which is imposed on top of any limitations of activity that we may have as individuals. Um, so we're, we're just trying at the moment to find ways of bringing in younger people and new people so that they understand that because the dominant view remains that we are the problem and that we need to fit in with what is considered to be normal society and the systems and practices that are created for and by non-disabled people. Um, disabled people's activism has changed. Um, I was talking earlier about the 1970s um, and at that time there was a group of disabled people um, who realised that they were confined into residential accommodation because 
the so-called normal systems and practices excluded disabled people who particularly this was a group of people who were mainly wheelchair users so physical barriers were um, very very evident and that stops people living in their own home getting out and about um, using transport and so on but there was another group who were particularly campaigning around finances basically saying give us enough money and everything will be all right so um, that group of people, again another snappy title, the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation, we call them UPS, um, and they were saying it's got to be about much more than just money, um, the whole system is, is leaving us out and that needs to change. And we've kind of gone back to that now. Because of austerity measures um, and what's happened to disabled people is um, money is gone. So if you can't work um, either because of your condition you may have, you may be ill, or you just may have um, limitations of activity that uh, doesn't allow you to work. But also the worst problem is discrimination from um, employers um, who, who basically will not employ disabled people. And the figures um, of employment for, of disabled people has not improved. In fact, it's probably got worse. The, the government claim it's better, but the quality of the work and the pay that people are given is really, really poor. So you still can't live on that. So the current campaigns are much more about trying to get those that benefit system improved again um, because it was you know it was better in the past it's gone worse now so in a sense it's kind of gone back to the 1970s that that um, income um, and, and making sure people have got enough money takes priority and that's really really important we can't stop doing that um, but political awareness of the other issues of the way that the whole structure of society. Um, is designed by and for non-disabled people. It doesn't take account of people with certain activity limitations um, which, which come from medical conditions. But exclusion from society doesn't come from medical conditions. It comes from the way that society is organised and doesn't take account of us. One of the major organisations, well it's not really an organisation, it's a network, the Disabled People's Direct Action Network. Um, and that started in the early 90s um, and I remember an event I went to which was Block Telethon because one of the big issues for disabled people um, then and to, to some extent now is rather than giving us um, equality and rights in society that charity um, is seen as a solution to the issues that we face. Um, so I went down to London Weekend Television on a coach with GMCDP so I met a lot of new people at that time um, from Manchester um, and a man called Alan Holdsworth went around with a clipboard asking people to sign up um, to a direct action network and this would be going out on the streets campaigning and bringing attention to the issues that we were facing and that was very very effective we did that for quite a few years there were some people who uh, we, we stopped the traffic we, we did stop the traffic on um, Parliament Square a few times I don't think you're allowed to do that now. Um, and it, it did bring attention to the issues. Um, and what was very interesting in, in, around that, around about 1994, I think it was, the Minister for Disabled People was um, Sir Nicholas Scott, and he denied that disabled people were discriminated against. But what was interesting was his daughter worked for an organisation called Radar, and she disagreed with her dad. So this was really interesting for the media. So they did pick up on that um, and were reporting on it. It was very embarrassing for the government because Sir Nicholas Scott actually misled the House by saying that disabled people were not discriminated against. BCODP had commissioned Colin Barnes to write a book and Colin um, became Professor of Disability Studies at the University of Leeds. He produced a book which used the government's own statistics and showed that disabled people were discriminated against. So all of that happening and the campaigns that disabled people had around, mainly in London, but we did go to other cities as well. Um, and in the end, the government did introduce the Disability Discrimination Act, which had um, a council which was really pretty ineffective. Um, but we did at least have a starting point of this legislation which was meant to stop um, discrimination against disabled people. And it has in some ways, um, but it you know, hasn't completely done that. That was repealed and replaced 
by the Equality Act in 2010. But we still do face um, discrimination and it's very, very hard to bring the case because every time you're discriminated against you have to take um, a civil case against whoever's done it and that's not practical. Um, so we still haven't got full cover in the law. Um, so that the network of disabled people's direct action network, we called it DAM, um, I still call it DAM, um, was pretty amazing and that was kind of like the height of disabled people's activism in this country um, and the, the, the social networks from that time, um, those of us that are left because we've lost far too many people over the years and recently in particular, um, we, we still do keep in touch. Um, we really want to be able to pass on the baton to younger disabled people um, and at the moment we're really struggling to do that. I referred to um, the protest we did outside London Weekend Television, Block Telethon, and that was the first proper demo that I went on. Um, and what the organisers had done was to set up an alternative to what was happening in London Weekend Television. So they had this big telethon going on, patronising disabled people um, and using pity as a way of trying to get in some money. And that kind of thing does still happen. And right across the road we had a disability arts event um, and it was the first time I'd seen anything like that and it was amazing. So we had our own songs um, and comedy sketches. Um, comedy is really, really important in, in, in any uh, group and we've seen it with other groups where comedy by the people themselves can bring about a change in culture. Um, so we have that in, with disability arts and it was, it was happening then and it's still happening now where um, in this case disabled people will poke fun at the way that society treats us but that really hits a chord um, perhaps much more than, than lectures and that kind of thing. Um, but I always remember that event because going down on the coach with GMCDP, meeting people from Manchester, and a lot of people I met for the very first time on that day um, became lifelong friends and are still friends now um, because we met time and again doing various different things. Um, and that was a big turning point for, for disabled people. Telethon was stopped after that, that was the last telethon. Um, there were other demonstrations against similar kind of events. But we do have some things that are similar. Maybe the, the edge has been taken off it. But this reliance on charity um, is not helpful. One of the difficulties we have is, in order to get enough money to live on and get the things that we need to live independently, we have to demonstrate all the things we cannot do. In order to get a job, we have to demonstrate what we can do. Um, and it's a real dilemma. <laughs> um, so how, how do you do these two things? Um, and, and that's still going on now, that's still a problem now. Um, well, as I've, I've mentioned earlier, the austerity measures have hit disabled people really, really hard. Um, and we've been disgraced by various reports. Um, the United Nations rapporteur um, has, has said that the way that disabled people treated is, is really important. I can't remember the exact quote now, um, but really put, put us to shame. The Equality and Human Rights Commission have produced various reports on um, disabled people in Britain. Um, so it's not just about the finances, but we are um, left out in so many ways. One of the big things that I've been um, working towards, um, and actually did a PhD in it, is homes for um, own occupation and whether disabled people can actually find somewhere to live. Um, and there's a certain standard in, um, in building regulations that's optional, um, which may, means that homes are more accessible because nobody knows um, if they're gonna need uh, access features in their own home tomorrow. Anybody can have an accident or, or be unwell and, and find that they can't move around in the same way. Um, so at the moment, trying to get the government to make that compulsory in all new homes. In Liverpool I've been able to get um, some commitment to that. So where the council has um, some kind of authority over the land, we can say to developers, you must build to this standard called lifetime homes. It's lifetime home standards, but it's actually equivalent to something in the building regulations. Um, so, so that's really important that we get that in place because having a decent home that you can use properly 
impact on everything else in life, so as it does to everybody else. Um, and it affects, it only affects social interaction. So disabled people remain very isolated. I talked about how in the 1970s people were trying to get out of residential institutions. Some people are still trapped in residential institutions because they can't find somewhere accessible to live or they're not getting enough support to live in their own homes. It's very social isolating. Um, and then that means that because we're not there taking part, non-disabled society will continue without us because they just don't think about us, literally don't think about us. Um, and often in situations where we'll come out, be out with some non-disabled people, really good friends, and I'll come up against some kind of physical barrier, and they're astounded. And I said, well, that happens to me every day. I didn't know, I really didn't know. So that kind of segregation and pushing to the margins is still happening. Um, and that's, we've got to fight that as well as the financial issues that are so difficult for disabled people at the moment. An interesting story from um, the Dan act, um, actions that we did, um, and, and also an example of how things can be changed when there's a will to do it. When we first started um, taking direct action and, and blocking roads and so on, the police didn't know what to do with us. They'd never seen disabled people, including wheelchair users and others, um, behaving in this way. We it was civil disobedience, we, you know, we weren't being aggressive or anything and also very careful about clearing up any litter that was always uh, been bad going around to make sure that we, you know, we, we were well behaved. But some people wouldn't move um, and so they were asked to move by the police um, and wouldn't move. Some people got out of the wheelchairs and were on the roadway and as a consequence some people were arrested by the police. But the vans that the police had were not accessible to wheelchair users. And neither were the police stations, so they couldn't actually get people into the police stations when they took them back. And I've never seen buildings so quickly all around the country um, get ramps put outside. Police stations all of a sudden had ramps outside. Um, so it can be done um, where there's a will to do it. Um, so that's quite a, an interesting little anecdote, I think, about. Um, Something that came about from Dan Actions, we got some access to police stations. <laughs>